everybody. It's such a privilege for me uh, on behalf of Cardiology Society of India, uh, the national body, and also the Cardiology Society of India, Chennai chapter. Such an honor uh, to host uh, this Cardiac Rhythm Council annual meeting in a digital platform, a very new experience, could be the trend in the future. And um, we have a galaxy of uh, the experts of arrhythmia and heart failure um, uh, to, be, to be speaking to all of us. And I thank every one of them, including the moderators. And uh, there is, uh, there is uh, this group of at least 150, I understand, the delegates who have uh, Thank you, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure. It's an honor. Uh, and uh, today is the inaugural day of this uh, so-called digital uh, the best of the minds of India in the fields of electrophysiology and heart failure. And, um, you know, my mentor, my teacher, and the most respected of the electrophysiologists in the country, Dr. Nasiman, is going to be leading the team of the moderation today and accompanied very ably by one of the experts, again, Dr. Raja Saluraja, who is the professor and the head of the Department of Electrophysiology at the Jipmar Pondicherry, and my friend, and, and the innovative brains, Dr. R.D. Yadavay, is also going to be giving company to Dr. Narsimhan. So may I request the moderator to take over and you know, start this inaugural session. Thank you. Thank you, Vulas. Um, and uh, it's indeed a great pleasure uh, to have Dr. Sanjay Dixit along with us. And uh, I, on behalf of uh, both Heart Rhythm Society as well as uh, my co-chairs, Dr. Raja and Dr. Yadave, would uh, at the outset like to thank uh, Sanjay for making this possible. Uh, to, because some of you are from general cardiology, I am forced to introduce uh, Sanjay because most of the people in EP uh, it's kind of, uh, it's redundant to introduce uh, Sanjay. Probably every one of you would know him. He is uh, the professor of uh, cardiology and electrophysiology from UPenn. Had a very illustrious car career throughout his uh, medical school and thereafter in the US. And uh, he has been currently serving as uh, the director of uh, electrophysiology department at the VA hospital. And he's a professor at uh, the UPenn. Uh, he has numerous awards, uh, rightfully so, very prestigious awards throughout his career. To name a few, there is uh, this AstraZeneca uh, David Hack Memorial Award in Cardiovascular Research and uh, ACCF uh, Procter & Gamble Career Development Award uh, for Arrhythmias and uh, more importantly, Wharton Business School Executive Leadership Training Course awarded through Cooper Leadership Society. He has uh, been on the planning committee of AHA, ACC, and World Congress in Cardiology. And uh, he has been the reviewer for every single uh, uh, arrhythmia journal. He has been uh, contributing immensely in terms of both uh, original work, uh, in terms of arrhythmias and ablation, and several review articles. And uh, he has been uh, helping to plan several of these programs of prestigious colleges like ACC and World Congress of Cardiology. And uh, it's a great honor and a real pleasure to have Sanjay along with us. He'll be talking to us about the outflow tract arrhythmias. Welcome, Sanjay. Floor is yours. Thank you, Narsimhan. That is a very, very kind introduction. and appreciate that very much. Also want to thank uh, Dr. Pandurangi and acknowledge the other chairs for this section, Dr. Yadav, Dr. Salvaraj. It's my privilege to be here. And the topic that I've been asked to speak on is uh, uh, outflow tract tachycardia. And uh, I hope I can make it worth your time for all the audience members who are here uh, today. So, uh, as the name suggests, uh, outflow tract tachycardia tend to arise from outflow tract region, which is a fairly large area at the uh, base of the heart and the top of the ventricles. But the uh, majority of outflow tract tachycardias seem to originate from a much narrower 
uh, location within this large region, and that includes the anterior septal aspect of the superior right ventricular outflow tract region, uh, the cusps, which are very close to this location, and I'll show you uh, that subsequently. The aortomitral continuity, which is this region between the mitral valve and the aortic valve, uh, the top of the mitral annulus, and the adjoining epicardium. So why outflow tract tachycardias arise from this very narrow belt remains a question that we haven't completely answered. What we do, however, know about outflow tract tachycardias is that the mechanism underlying these arrhythmias is delayed after depolarization-mediated triggered activity. And whether this region in some ways can sustain that mechanism uniquely than other parts of the heart is a possible explanation why these tachycardias are confined to this location. But I want to just spend a, a few minutes here reviewing this particular slide only because it has bearings on how we treat these tachycardias. So this is sort of a generic model that was developed based on the work done by Bruce Lerman and his colleagues uh, in describing the mechanisms underlying outflow tachycardias. So what we know about delayed after depolarization mediated triggered activity is that it happens at the end of the depolarization cell uh, phase when the cell is hyperpolarized so and results from calcium overflow. So the calcium channel opens up to release a large amount of calcium ion which causes DAD mediated triggered activity and that is mediated by cyclic AMP. So the more cyclic AMP, the more phosphorylation of protein kinase, the more will the calcium channel open and release the calcium ion. And this conversion of ATP to cyclic AMP is determined by the interplay of the inhibitory and the stimulatory proteins. And you can see the stimulatory proteins is uh, <clears throat> activated by catecholamines, whereas adenosine and acetylcholine work on the inhibitory protein and clamp down on the cyclic AMP. Generation. So you can see how the interplay of these and the factors that influence them can have an impact on outflow tract tachycardias. So when we think about outflow tract tachycardias, what are the clinical characteristics of these arrhythmias? So I'm sure all of you who have taken care of patients with these tachycardias would appreciate that they seem to have a fairly wide presentation. You can have fairly young uh, folks present with these arrhythmias, kids, or you can see them all the way out into the GDR population. But if you really try to look at how the distribution is, it seems to have a bimodal distribution, either patients very young or in their middle. And why that happens, we don't have an explanation. Uh, there are several theories about that possibility of you know, what determines that developmental versus uh, uh, age related. They seem to be more often in women, and there are certain factors that seem to bring them up. So certainly all those things that increase your heart rate, whether it's exercise, stress, caffeine, that seems to uh, perpetuate these arrhythmias. Interestingly, in women, there seems to be actually a stronger association with uh, hormonal imbalance, and they seem to be much more prominent around menstrual cycle or the gestation phase of pregnancy compared to, obviously, exercise being a bigger trigger than that. Now, the presentation of these arrhythmias can be wide-ranging. Patients can sometimes be highly symptomatic, palpitations. Sometimes they can present with pre -syncope. It is pretty rare for these arrhythmias to uh, lead to frank syncope, which is good because that has implications in how we treat. And then, of course, a large number of these patients are asymptomatic. And that has to be factored into the decision-making in terms of how we treat. So thinking about the treatment and the management of outflow tract tachycardias, the fact that they happen in the majority of patients who have structurally normal heart, and most of the times they present as PVCs or non-sustaining UT, we have the luxury of trial and error because they are usually not nice. So as I showed you in that previous slide, the different ways in which the calcium channel is regulated, and that's how you can uh, influence uh, that development of the tachycardia and then uh, treat the different uh, 
uh, stages of how cyclic AMP is determined. So beta blockers, as you would remember, that it works by counteracting the catecholamines on the stimulatory protein. And beta blockers can be quite effective for these arrhythmias. They don't necessarily get rid of them completely, but they may attenuate the burden and certainly make the patients feel a little better. Calcium channel blockers work on the last stage of the calcium ion release, and so they can actually have a synergistic effect with beta block. The challenge, however, is that it's sometimes hard to give both these drugs together because of the side effects that they can have. Uh, most antiarrhythmic drugs are also fairly effective in the treatment of these arrhythmias. And if somebody presents with sustained VT, which is rare, then adenosine or can, can be used for acute termination. So for all the reasons that we talked about and you know how these arrhythmias are tolerated, ablation therapy is typically not offered as the first treatment option for these patients. And uh, even though it's highly effective, and I'll show you in the subsequent slides how effective it is, nevertheless, it's reserved either for patients who have failed or are intolerant to these drugs. There is, however, a subgroup of patients with outflow tract tachycardias that develop cardiomyopathy because of the burden of these arrhythmias. And the data shows that if your PVC burden or arrhythmia burden is above 10%, more than 10,000 PVCs in 24 hours, then that seems to be a cutoff after which tachycardia mediated cardiomyopathy is a real possibility in some patients. And so if a patient does have tachycardia mediated cardiomyopathy, then ablation therapy is probably the best way to manage them because it is the most definitive and effective way to treat these areas. And the key to um, successful ablation is first to localize accurately where these tachycardias are coming from. The mechanism, as I said, is delayed after depolarization mediated triggered activity, which means that the source of these arrhythmias is focal, just a small area. And if you can localize it, and then you can get your cancer to that spot, then usually energy delivery and the effect of energy delivery is pretty good. And so that's why ablation therapy seems to be quite effective. And the tools that we use for ablation therapy, most important is ECG, which can help us localize these tachycardias. And we'll go through that in the next few slides. So in just uh, talking a little bit about the arrhythmia ablation experience at Penn, we are a fairly high volume center. And in this 20 year experience of more than 5,000 VT ablations, at least 40% of the cases that we do are in patients who have structurally normal heart or idiopathic uh, ventricular arrhythmias. And within that group, the largest number of cases are patients with outflow tract tachycardia. So for us, it's actually a very important entity uh, that we do a lot of relations on. Now, our own experience in terms of you know, how we ablated these tachycardias, which is conceptualized and summarized in this slide, a 15-year experience from 1999 to 2015, what we have noticed is that in the early phase of our experience, a lot of these outflow back tachycardias, the site that we were able to successfully ablate them from was in the right ventricular outflow back region. But over time, what we've noticed is that now more and more of our patients are manifesting the site of origin of these tachycardias in the non rv regions, particularly the aortic cusp region and the LVOT. And that becomes a little bit more challenging to map and relate. But nevertheless, with the tools that we have, uh, we have been very successful in targeting these. But the important message of the slide is that you have to be cognizant that just because somebody has the classic manifestations of an output tract tachycardia, it does not necessarily mean that they are coming from the RV mode. And so the reason why that potentially happens is because of how close the structures in this region are. I showed you the heart model to some clues, but when you have these patients in the lab and you do orthogonal fluoroscopy and you have catheters in different parts of the outflow tract region, 
um, you can see the relative proximity. So in the first uh, set of uh, pictures, it shows how close the cusp region is to the RVOT. These two catheters are virtually touching, even though they are in different chambers. The middle picture shows a catheter in the cusp region and another catheter has been advanced through the coronary sinus into the great cardiac vein, again showing you the epicardial aspect of the basal LV and we're very close to the cusp region. And then the last slide shows you how close you can get to the epicardial aspect of the basal LV by putting a catheter under the aortic valve and mapping the endocardial aspect of the left aortic. So because of the proximity of, of all these locations, outflow tachycardias tend to have certain common features, and that is an inferior directed axis because they are at the top of the ventricles. And then depending how leftward and rightward they are, you can either have a left bundle branch block morphology, which is predominantly negative forces of the QRS complexes in the B1, or a right bundle branch block morphology, which is predominantly positive forces of the QRS complexes in the B1. So why these um, manifestations happen, I'll try to uh, um, show you the, the reason for that. And so let's, uh, let's try to work through this slide. So at the very top is uh, the depiction of the outflow tract region created using electron atomic mapping. The aortic valve is in the center. The RVOT, the superior aspect of that, sits a little higher than the cusp region, and then the mitral valve is fairly close and at the same level as the cusp region. At the bottom here is a cartoon which kind of shows the same thing, but when you're looking down from the coronal aspect, the RVOT is a crescent which sits very close to the cusp region with the superior anterior aspect close to the left coronary cusp, the posterior aspect close to the right coronary cusp. And this is an orientation as you travel from the right to the left side of the different structures that you encounter. And so what I'm going to show you here are base maps that are done from different aspects of the RVOT and the rest of the output back region as you move from the right to the left. So the rightward moves to the free wall of the RVOT. The next structure as you travel leftward is the septal aspect of the RVOT. And then the next structure is the right coronary cusp followed by the interventricular septum and then the left coronary cusp. And after that comes the AMC. So this is fairly intuitive. Now the effect of going from right to left is manifest in what happens to the QRS complexes in lead V1 and the precordial transition. So when you're very rightward or on the free wall of the RBOT, you have left bundle branch block forces and a late precordial transition. Generally, any precordial transition that happens at V4 or after is typically considered late. When you travel from right to left, the precordial transition starts becoming earlier and earlier. But mind you, even when you're on the left side of the interventricular septum, the QRS complexes in B1 are still predominantly negative. But once you get past this location and get to the left coronary cusp, now you begin to see biphasic forces in B1. And once you get to the AMC, you have predominantly positive forces, although there may be a small community. So that's how you can anticipate how these different locations create these ECG forces. Now, the same methodology can be used to appreciate QRS morphology in the 12 lead ECG in the rest of the basal left ventricular endocardium. So once again, moving from the lateral most aspect to the septal most aspect. In the lateral mitral annulus, top of the mitral annulus, AMC region, and the left interventricular septum. If you focus on lead B1, anything that is lateral to the AMC region will have monophasic R. AMC is the cutoff where you lose these initial lengths. So one of the manifestations of AMC is a small cube followed by a large R wave 
with inferior reproductive forces, that's almost sine qua non. Now, lead two can also be helpful, and the inferior leads can be helpful. And this is just a manifestation of how high or low the location is. So anything that's on the lateral most aspect or the medial most aspect of the basal LV tends to be a little bit lower. And so in these two locations, you can have not as positive, but sometimes even negative forces in two, three. But for the rest of the locations, top of the mitral annulus, ANC region, you will have positive forces in two, three. And lead one can also be helpful, and we'll get into that a little bit more in the subsequent slides. So I guess one thing to keep in mind is that, you know, I've talked about how these uh, tachycardias manifest in the different leads, but the key to that is that the leads have to be correctly placed, particularly the chest leads, and especially leads we want to beat. And so this is showing you what, if the leads are incorrectly placed, can do to the QRS morphology. So in this particular case, what we did is looked at the new move leads V1 and V2 from the traditional location, which is the fourth intercostal space on either side of the sternum, to either one intercostal space above or one intercostal space below, how that can influence the QRS morphology. If you move the leads down an intercostal space, you see more of the heart, so you see more positive forces in leads V1. If you move the leads one into the space up from where they traditionally are, you see less of the heart, and so the negative force become more common. And the way this could influence the ECG morphology is because, as I showed you, typically something in the RVOT tends to have negative forces in the V1. But if that lead is incorrectly placed a little bit lower, then you may start seeing some positive forces in the V1 that may make you think the tachycardia is coming LVOT with the cosmology, and vice versa if you move the leads one into process. Now, another lead, as I told you a uh, slide ago, is lead one, and how that can also help us localize tachycardia. This is particularly helpful when you're looking at the superior RVOT, where you still get a lot of lead output back tachycardia from. So the superior RVOT, and this is again an electroanatomic map, and you're looking from the head end into the RVOT region, can be divided into a free wall aspect, a septum aspect. And then you can also have an anterior aspect and a posterior aspect. And we use this numbering system at Penn to quickly try to you know, give a location rather than verbalizing it. So numbers one represent posterior aspect of the superior RVOT, but then it's on the free wall or the septal side. And number three represents anterior aspect in this particular location. And the point here is that if you focus just on the one, the base maps from the free wall and the septal aspect of the posterior anterior RVOT tend to generate negative forces, whereas space maps from the posterior aspect of the RVOT tend to generate positive forces. So that's how you can further localize the tachycardia in the superior RVOT. Now, lead one also can be influenced if the limb leads are in. So the typical position of the limb leads in doing an ECG is either on the extremity or on the shoulder. But sometimes when these patients are put through a stress test, which is not an uncommon maneuver to bring out output at tachycardias, oftentimes to reduce motion artifact, you move the leads anteriorly from the shoulder to the chest. And in doing so, you can shift the axis of lead one much more in front of the heart. And what that can do is, if a tachycardia is coming from the posterior RVOT, as is shown in this example, or a base map is being performed from the posterior superior RVOT, as shown in the second example, this is what the forces should look like in the leads of correctly placed, which is positive forces of one. However, moving these leads anteriorly to the chest, you can see completely changes the axis in lead one, both from the tachycardia and the base. So you cannot pay attention to this. You can also get pulled into thinking that the tachycardia is coming from a different location. So those are things to uh, keep in mind. Now, 
We'll talk now in the next five minutes about some of the regions that are very unique. So the cusp region is an important region because it sits very close to the RDOT. The right coronary cusp is in close proximity to the posterior aspect of the RDOT. The uh, left coronary cusp is in close proximity to the anterior aspect of the RDOT. And so tachycardias originating from the cusp region can share features with RBOT region. And it is important to be able to discriminate that because mapping in the RBOT is very different from mapping in the cusp region, both in terms of the approach, potential complications, power delivery, et cetera, et cetera. So a good way to be able to differentiate these two locations using surface CCG is uh, this particular criteria that was developed by my friend and colleague, Ed Gershenfeld, when he was here with us at Penn. So here are two examples of patients. Both have uh, what looks like classic output by technical positive forces into the ABF and left pathology. So is this tachycardia originating in the RBOT or the cusp region? Now that can be challenging just based on looking at the morphology of the tachycardia. But this is where he came up with this particular differentiating criteria where you plot the R to S ratio of sinus rhythm QRS complex to the V2 versus the ventricular arrhythmia complexes in the same amount. And after plotting this ratio, you come up with the number of that calculation. And in a series of uh, 36 patients that we looked at for this paper, a cutoff value of 0.6 was highly predicted. So if this ratio was more than 0.6, then the tachycardia was very unlikely to become RBOT and more likely to become cusping. Now, a simple rule for applying this formula may be that if you have left bundle branch block morphology, and precordial transition is late by before or after, usually that's the argument. If the precordial transition is early, but weak two, it's generally late. If the precordial transition is in V3, then you can use the ratio. So that's how you can potentially work in trying to localize these type of problems. Now, other challenges in mapping the outdoor pack region. So one of these entities that a lot of us deal with and struggle to actually target is outflow tax tachycardias that originate from the summit. So the LB summit is this hypothetical region, which is a triangle. Excuse me, doctor. I'm extremely sorry to interrupt you, sir. Your screen will be going off in the next two minutes. Thank you. Okay. I thought we started a little late, two minutes after the actual times. That's what I factored into my talk. But yeah, feel free to cut me off if you want to. So this is the way the LB summit triangle is created. It is the bifurcation of the left main into the LAD and the circumflex. The base of the triangle is formed by um, sort of an imaginary line at the first septal perforator. And the great cardiac vein travels through this triangle and bisects it into two regions, the septal, basal, and the lateral aspect. And what we found is that tachycardias that actually originate from the lateral aspect of this triangle, you can actually ablate them epicardially much more successfully than those that arise from the basal region. And the way you can differentiate them is, again, using certain ECG features. So the two-wave ratio of AVL to AVR is greater than 1.8. That suggests more lateral origination. If the R to S ratio in the V1 is greater than 2, that suggests more lateral and if there's the lack of an initial Q wave in the V1, that also suggests lack of information. Now, again, just something to keep in mind, the summit region is on the epicardium. It's a relatively thick uh, muscle dimension here. And so oftentimes to target this, you have to deliver a lot of power from adjacent locations, including the great cardiac vein, or in some cases, the septal aspect. When you do that, you just have to be mindful of the LAD that travels in that location or if you're on the epicardial aspect of the vein, you can also encounter the trifurcation of the epicardial 
us. So that's the challenge. Some of the other things to keep in mind, uh, the outflow tract region can have different uh, locations based on the orientation of the heart. So the forces that you expect from the outflow tract region may be attenuated in older patients where the heart is a little bit more horizontal and that uh, leads to free and AV as um, positive. Uh, also, uh, in some cases, outflow tract tachycardias uh, can originate above the pulmonic valve. Uh, this was a very early experience reported in 2003. Since then, there have been larger series where there has been a demonstration of targeting these tachycardias above the pulmonic valve. Uh, just sort of as a disclaimer, we have done uh, over uh, 682 patients in this paper that I showed you previously. I just want to show it to you again. In none of these patients, we ever had to go above the pulmonic valve to ablate our VOT And the point of this paper is that in our cumulative experience extending from 1999 to 2015, regardless of when we were doing these study projects, our acute procedural success was about 86%. And clinical success has also been roughly around that, uh, regardless of whether we were using traditional tools, which is just fluoroscopy versus electroanatomic mapping versus eyes. The only difference is in our more recent experience, we seem to be requiring less repeat ablation. And the complication rates for our tachycardias, uh, ablating them has been about 2%. So just to make the point that catheter ablation is highly effective. And in order to be able to perform it, you have to do careful analysis of the ECG as the first step. And then using tools like electroatomic mapping and ice imaging, you can really be very, very precise with catheter manipulation. And even though catheter ablation is quite safe and effective, right now it's reserved as a treatment for patients who have failed antirhythmics. I certainly hope that you know, some of the experience that we share in our publications will move the field where this can be considered primary or first line therapy uh, for the outbreak and technical patients. So I'm going to stop here and I uh, thank you for your attention. Over to the moderators. Narsiman can unmute and you know you can take over. Narsiman to unmute. Right. I'll uh, ask a wonderful talk as usual. Uh, Sanjay, thank you so much. Uh, we'll invite uh, my coaches, Dr. Raja, as well as Yadave. <laughs> Uh, to have their comments, we'll have their comments and then uh, invite the questions. Uh, I looked the chat box. No question was asked by any in the, by the audience. Uh, the other way, you will not be able to see. Uh, you know, there are questions here. Uh, okay. there, there are several questions here. Uh, would you like to take uh, over those questions first, or would you like to make a quick remark? Because in the chat box, I am not able to see. Uh, you, don't, you don't. You will not be able to see. Uh, uh, Dr. Can you forward it to Sanjay directly? The yes, whatever yes, question. Yes, yes, yes. Doctor Sanjay, you know what? Uh, the, the the questions are the same thing. What you have been uh, given, so you can go on. You know, putting that up and then uh, discuss some something about it. Okay. So sure. Sure. Talk, uh, the same thing, or you can extemporarily talk about those questions. Most of the questions are the one what you have said. Uh, gotcha. the, there was a question that what is the recurrence rate after ablation? Right. So, um, in general, um, the recurrence rate, um, so the success rate of 85 to 89 percent that we reported, uh, that is, uh, suggests a recurrence rate for us of about 15 to 20 percent uh, following ablation of these type of bodies. So, Single procedure efficacy is about 85%. Uh, do you take other ECG like V3R or V7, V8, V9? Uh, that's a good question. And uh, several people have suggested doing that. Uh, we have not used that in any uh, rigorous or uh, a scientific way to validate some of our algorithms. But I can see the value of moving the leads around to localize certain spots. Um, Absolutely. I think Dr. Selvaraj, do you have some questions you can ask? Well, that was a fantastic talk. Uh, thanks, Dr. Dixit. Um, 
So I think there's one question here which they have pasted from there, which is, uh, is there a relevance? The understanding the mechanism, does it uh, in some way guide us to ablation therapy? That's an excellent question. So, so far what we know of the output rat tachycardia is that because of the mechanism, the site is focal and the activation pattern is centrifugal. And usually at the site of ablation, you expect your uh, catheter timing to be maybe 15 or 20 milliseconds ahead of the tachycardia. But there are certain locations, for example, in the cusp region, you can sometimes have fibers of muscle that extend where you can have the local activation to see the rest of the QRS by as much as 50 milliseconds or more. So depending on the region where you are targeting these, you may have different cutoff values. One thing to pay attention to, and this is where uh, this entity is somewhat underdiagnosed. So usually outward tract tachycardia is because of the underlying mechanism delayed after demobilization mediated triggered activity. That's evanescent. It should not be something that should sustain VT. Usually it can do PVC with non-sustained VT. So if you have sustained VT, you have to really think about some other explanation. Even though they get binned as output that technology is because the echo may look normal, the sustained VT is unusual for So you have to really think about whether there is some structural heart disease that you're missing. Sometimes people can have an interceptive substrate where you can have re-entry, but an echo may not show it. You may need to think about more advanced imaging. So if it's a sustained VT, explore and make sure there's no fibrosis or something. Can I have one more question, sir? Uh, about uh, any outflow VT may lead to short coupled onset leading to VT, VF or flutter, ventricular flutter. Do you have some cases like that? So I think this is where we also have to... Um, you normal know, heart, structurally normal heart. Yeah, so I mean, we have certainly seen that happen in cases of idiopathic VF and the most common PVCs for those uh, cases, they either tend to be papillary muscle or the outflow tract region. There is some discussion about how Brugada may be a structurally abnormal heart with something localized to the outflow tract region. And even though phase three re-entry has been considered as the underlying mechanism for the PVCs, that may not necessarily be true. That being said, if you think about idiopathic VF cases, and I don't have any accumulated data to say that that's how it ought to be. Usually when you think about polymorphic VT being precipitated by a PVC, those PVCs for the classic long QT, they are mediated by EAD, early after depolarization mediated to activity, phase three. And usually in them, the underlying heart rate is slow, right? So R on T phenomenon is usually EAD mediated. And the underlying heart rate is increased. Whereas with outflow tract tachycardia, which is DAD mediated, the underlying heart rates tend to be a little faster. In fact, that's one of the ways to differentiate it. So I'm not sure if you necessarily see idiopathic VTV up with your classic outflow tract tachycardia because of the DAD mediated treatment activity, which requires a faster heart rate. It's a phase four depolarization. I'm not going to answer that question. How frequently you use uh, ice in RVOT or LVOT VT? There was a ice. question. Yeah. We never do any VT ablation without ice. Okay. Any in more fact, questions? ice has been the game changer because it helps you very quickly create the shell besides catheter localization. So it's become now to us an essential tool. So all our cases are done ice. Any more questions, sir? Narsiman, sir, you have any question? Very wonderful summary of uh, everything. Uh, we have seen a little bit of change in morphology when you ablate an exit of uh, uh, aortic cuspal VT from the right side. You have a transient success, but then the patient will come back with a recurrence. That's because you have sealed one exit and there are these uh, multiple exits. Uh, but we see this more often characteristically in aortic cuspal VTs. Uh, have you seen this phenomenon? 
Yeah, no, absolutely, not, Simon. I think uh, when we look at our experience, and as I told you, our early experience, we were targeting a lot of these in the RVOT. I think the tachycardia could still have been a cusp PVC. We were just targeting the exit side. But if you don't get to the source, then you can see how they can change the patient. We have seen that happen certainly in the cusp region, but also a lot with the LV summit. Because on the LV summit, you can have all these different exits and you really have to, and you can't really get to the source most of the time because it's on the epicardium under the coronary vessels. So there you have to be very meticulous in targeting the different exit sites. The PVC will change morphology and it does require a lot of ablation from various patients. Finally, it was about so thank you, Dr. Nasiman. Uh, you know, wonderful. You know, it was great. You know, it was the inaugural session. And you know, Dr. Nasiman, I would I take right here. Two hundred and fifty uh, uh, people are actually witnessing this event. I think this is a great success. And you know, it's all uh, Sanjay. Uh, you please take credit. We all waited for your talk. This is one of the one of the important talks here because this is one of those VTs which Indian electrophysiology community can actually deal with without much of a, a hardware, et cetera. Thank you so very much for being so very kind. You finished, you know, I know uh, we would have gone on forever, but you try to make your uh, talk very compact. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Nasimha. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank, thank you. My pleasure. Uh, thank you very much. Congratulations on this. So, so uh, you know, we are going quickly uh, to another important talk by uh, one of the uh, experts in the country, a very well accomplished electrophysiologist, Dr. Aigriudov my dear friend, and you know, we have a set of moderators, Ajit Kumar, he is the professor and the head of the department of Sri Chitra uh, uh, Electrophysiology Department. We have got one distinguished Dr. P.S. Mohan Murugan, uh, who is the uh, accomplished interventional cardiologist of Chennai City, and of course, Dr. K. Tamil Selvan, who are going to be moderating. I request uh, Dr. Ajit to take over, introduce our distinguished uh, uh, speaker today, uh, the second talk, Dr. Hagriyurao. Over to Dr. Ajit. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. At the outset, I should um, uh, <clears throat> wish all of you a very happy autumn. And with that, I'll begin. Um, of course, I think all of you are quite familiar with uh, Dr. Hagi Rao. He is the director and the head of uh, electrophysiology at the Kim's Group of Hospitals in Hyderabad. I've been mean, um, specifically and particularly impressed by his um, interest in research, especially in sudden cardiac death and areas related to VT. He's, of course, the editors of a lot of other cardiology journals as well. But he has a very keen interest in research. And that's probably what makes him different. Over to you, Dr. Hygrim. This VT storm is a very interesting problem that all of us will meet, not as electrophysiologists, but also as cardiologists. So over to you, Dr. Hygrim. Thank you. Thank you, sir, uh, for a very kind introduction. And uh, thank you, Ullas, for this opportunity to talk in this forum. Uh, I've been asked to talk about a case on VT storm. Now, we had a series of uh, cases of VT storm. There is one which actually made us learn a lot of lessons and the lessons which I would like to share with uh, everyone. And that is what I'm going to present. Now, a VT storm, basically, by definition, is three or more episodes of VT or VF in 24 hours requiring intervention of defibrillator. Incidence is 10 to 28 percent. The important thing is, is a twofold high risk, a risk of all cause mortality. Now, for those of you who are doing interventions, I would like to say that you see stent thrombosis, but uh, when you see a VT storm, stent thrombosis would look like an angel. Now, this is a patient, a 59 year old gentleman, hypertensive, old antriolamide, very remote antriolamide. And he also had a documented sinus node dysfunction, which he was uh, managing. He had one episode of syncope. The echo showed a, a regional wall motion abnormality in LRD territory, moderate LV dysfunction, 35%. And angiogram was done at old proximal LRD lesion, for which he was getting medical management and uh, nothing impressive otherwise. Now, obviously, we are thinking of a sudden cardiac death in a patient with old antrivalamai and syncope. And so we did a cardiac MRI for him. What we did saw in a cardiac MRI is a large transmural non-viable LED territory, and uh, which was expected for the old antiviral MI and uh, moderate LED dysfunction. But interestingly, we also found a large, uh, a significant LV clot, clot at the apex going upwards to uh, transing to the septum. 
now we'll talk about this uh, issue the elderly court lot issue a little while later but what was clear was this patient was a candidate for sudden cardiac death and we were thinking of evaluating him further at this point in the icu itself he had a documented syncopal vt so that completely clinched the diagnosis now there was nothing to do because he had a sinus node dysfunction we implanted a dual chamber icd uh, and he discharged with standard medications now 20 days later patient had two appropriate shocks medical management we stepped up his metoprolol amadarone lower rate of program to 50 we wanted as low as possible rhythm was atrial paced we thought you know we had uh, probably got over the crisis and uh, he would uh, continue with this kind of thing but actually what happened was he had three appropriate shocks in 12 hour duration in a month later hemodynamically stable and he was brought from a remote place to hyderabad because uh, he was not living close by and there was no medical facility there they were bringing him in a vehicle and he brought here and uh, despite the different antiarrhythmic drugs we gave him he continued to have icd shocks and while coming uh, when we interrogated him we realized that in the journey he had had 13 episodes of uh, uh, requiring intervention so obviously we are dealing with a storm he was electively intubated amadarone and we maximally tolerated metoprolol was given atrial pacing was increased there was a thought that we increase the atrial pacing it suppresses the vpcs so we tried to increase the fortunately he had dual chamber icd so atrial pacing increased suppressivity but he continued to have vt uh, unrelentingly now the problem was the challenge was this patient had we thought of doing an ablation but the problem was this patient as i told you had lv clot you can see we repeated the echo an organized lv clot still there which was the same thing which was previously seen on the mri now the problem is if you do an endocard catheter catheter manipulation the concern is it can potentially dislodge this thrombus and result in a cardioembolic stroke so you are in a catch situation where we cannot do an ablation easily so this patient was referred to a uh, onco surgeon who does the cervical symphrectomy at our center he used a, a quite um, fancy equipment used a robotic to cut off the sympathetic uh, ganglia so what we do is a surgical procedure uh, done for vt storm it is well described in many centers in the world and well documented in literature it is a surgical procedure where there is excision of the distal half of the stellate ganglion and t1 to t4 sympathetic chain and that's exactly what was done on the theater and they sent it for a frozen section to prove that they had done the job and what actually happens is as you can see the thoracic ganglia they the thoracic uh, spinal cord and the temporary ganglia they have inputs sympathetic inputs to the heart and these fuel the vts and the vt storm so what actually we do by doing the sympathetic ganglionectomy is to uh, cause an a very high intensive beta blockade because you are cutting off the sympathetic supply to the heart and then we try to achieve a, a relief from vt storm so we did start that we had done the job three days after sympathetectomy he developed recurrent appropriate shocks for vt continue to have shocks now this was a nightmare situation look look at the uh, vts and you got 26 episodes of vt you can see a lot of patient a lot of episodes had atp converted and uh, shocks were there but predominantly in the vf range are very fast ventricular tachycardia resulting in a, a lot of shocks so this was a very difficult situation then we realize the patient is in mechanical ventilation with paralysis completely knocked down uh, there is no sympathetic uh, inputs because uh, you know you had already done a sympathetectomy we will try to look for if there are any reversible causes but all the biochemical parameters are normal icd was shut off now and only external shocks were given because it just drained the battery patient continued to have recurrent vt despite all medications repeated electrical cardioversions were performed and uh, something like 70 the you know you had a fellow keeping on shocking and uh, doing these kind of things so this was a situation at which we decided that uh, we were in a uh, we were pushed to the wall we had a clot in the lv we had already done all that we could and this was a patient who continued to have vt we need to do something so then we decided that uh, risk or no risk we had to do a 3d mapping guided ablation was planned for this patient with the risk of a stroke and all this explained to the patient now what what we saw when we took him to the lab now i'm going to show you the pictures i'm going to show you in the next couple of things are all in the lab ep lab uh, you know uh, made it at a speed that is uh, looks like an ecg for easy uh, understanding so what we saw was a vt a sustained monomorphic vt but the problem was these vts were hemodynamically unstable the moment the vt came we had to shock it to sinus rhythm 
and more importantly not only does the vt was unstable but there are multiple morphologies of vt as you can see here the 23 avf is positive and uh, there you can uh, see somewhere else that it is uh, negative so these kind of uh, multiple morphologies of vt and these are broad notched these are narrow so not only there are multiple morphologies not only they are hemodynamically unstable but they are interchanging this was changing to this this was changing to this so this made it mapping almost impossible so these unstable vts multiple morphologies so then we decided that this patient had to be uh, substrate based mapping so this patient was completely converted to sinus rhythm with a anesthetist putting on the maximum propofol and uh, uh, keeping him paralyzed and then made him uh, for a uh, sinus rhythm for the time of uh, mapping what we did was uh, then we started doing a voltage map now as we can see this is a three dimensional map in the sinus rhythm of this patient what you can see the red area is all the scarred the infected area and the pink area is the healthy area and the one the colored area is in between and we can see the voltage between 0.5 to 1.5 that means anything less than 0.5 was a scar so you can see there a lot of dense scar extensive mapping initially about 538 points of map all over and uh, then what you can see is uh, the different views showing the large extent of the scars the scar in the left ventricle the whole thing is a map of the left ventricle now what we uh, found was the potentials now the important thing was uh, mapping in the area between the scar and the normal area this is the colored area you can see these are the borderline areas so when we mapped in this area so we found different kinds of potentials one was the isolated potentials you can see the v1 is a uh, ecg the corresponding to it is the electrogram but you see the actually electrogram is very far away from the electrogram so these are the late potentials the isolated late potentials we try to ablate them and you can see that the uh, amplitude of the late potential as you ablate comes down completely it goes away so we try to uh, map for these late potentials and the next the potentials was the continuous electrical activity like this you can see that the entire qrs complex is represented but not by a uh, a precise electrogram but by a continuous low voltage electrical activity like this so these are the continuous electrical activity we targeted this and if you look at the all the electrograms we targeted one was the late potentials one was the fragmented potentials one was the double potentials that a single electro ec electrogram is represented by two electrograms and not one showing that the area of block in between them and these are the fragmented late potentials so all these things were uh, targeted for ablation on these points and you can see that uh, we map we mark this by color the each of the electrograms that i showed was marked by specific color blue represent this for example yellow representing a late potential and blue representing a cea and so on and so forth so what represents these red dots and brown dots are all the abnormal areas were targeted and were ablated systematically in all these areas so you can notice that most of these abnormal potentials are in the border zone not in the scar not in the healthy zone but in the border zone with a colored activity that is in between the scar and the normal myocardium this is where most of the abnormal electrograms were there so patiently carefully all these electrograms were as many as could be mapped as many as we could see they were all but at the end of the ablation there was no spontaneous vt program stimulation this was very gratifying because this patient had so many vts in the last few days programmed electrical stimulation from rv and lv with single and double electro stimuli did not induce vt we did not do any further uh, uh, heroic methods to induce we were quite happy with uh, what was achieved now what is important is the two day two he was extubated there was no neurological deficit and uh, this was most gratifying thing more than as as important as the vt ablation and no further vt episodes during hospital stay patient was discharged after four days with amadarone and metoprolol vt and no evidence of vt in the last five years on icd interrogation now there are two messages and two lessons we learned in this one was a protocol driven strategy for vt storm and the old lv clot is no other contraindication is not a contraindication for endocardial ablation the first one was a protocol driven strategy when our it is storm we we actually had a lot of cases of this we uh, compiled about 12 cases and published them to show a protocol what we actually saw that we should have a protocol in the institution that is exactly what we were trying to learn and trying to share 
is that patients with VT storm either have a recurrent VT or an appropriate ICD shocks. The first thing is to work up for reversible causes, including ischemia. In fact, two of our patients who had actually uh, unrevascularized areas, which we undergoed stenting or a you know graft, and uh, patients had thyrotoxicosis. And important point I'd like to see is that mechanical ventilation. All patients had mechanic. Almost all of them had mechanical ventilation. So sedation and mechanical ventilation is extremely important in VT storm. We realized, and eventually all of them should undergo a mapping and ablation. You know, when it is not possible, either sympatectomy can be an adjuvant to it or can be an isolated, you can be or, either or. And you know, 85.6% survived to discharge and uh, and most of them are alive, 14 are alive, uh, all of them are alive at uh, more than three years with uh, VT recurrence in two, but they're medically managed. The second thing is LV thrombus. We were very scared of LV thrombus causing uh, uh, dislodgement and strokes. But then we were pushed to a corner. We would not have done this case otherwise. We are other cases. We had never done a uh, ablation with a thrombus before. But with this, where we were pushed to the corner and we did, and uh, we were trying to look around the world if anybody had a large series with that. And we pulled out, and Dr. Kalyan was kind enough to pull out his uh, archives, and uh, we published our cases along with his, and where we looked up and showed that in a patient with LV thrombus also, uh, with old organized LV thrombus, I mean we can do a VT ablation and the uh, ablation results were similar to those uh, without thrombus in historical controls. So it is, sh it is shown that epi and endocardial is safe. And subsequently, actually, we had two other cases. We had it, uh, old organized thrombus with the VT storm. We, sim we simply went ahead with ablation without... I'm subject. extremely sorry to interrupt you, sir. Two minutes to screen time. I'm coming to the last sorry, slide. Sorry, sir. Two minutes to screen time. Thank you very much. Most welcome, sir. So, so the, in end, I would like to say that VT storm is a extremely uh, scary uh, situation that a cardiologist, electrophysiologist faces in the lab, and uh, these are the things which that uh, a protocol-driven strategy is extremely important because we realize as we go across the protocol, there are a lot of things that uh, need not, uh, you know, uh, go all the way. Sedation and mechanical ventilation is paramount. Maximizing beta blocker. And radio frequency ablation with the 3D mapping is almost always uh, required, and it has really improved uh, the success rates and uh, the uh, results of VT Strong. Thank you very much once again. Thank you, Dr. Hygrieve, and over to the moderators. Thank you, nice thank you Hygrieve, for that uh, excellent case, uh, uh, fantastic case presentation. In fact, in all of our series, we have not had any patients with an LV clot sitting down. I, I will just make one point and then give it to the other moderators. See, in that uh, MRI which you had shown, it did not look like an organized thrombus. It almost looked like a fresh thrombus. I was a little worried about that, one. And two is that, as um, uh, somebody said, pointed out, is that you can use carotid filters. Of course, we have not used that while doing the ablation. And the other point, that one perhaps is an important point for everybody to take note is that we have to note the triggers down. What we found is that in majority of our cases, they, they had hypokalemia as a major trigger. So if you correct hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia, the level of potassium should be above 4 and uh, magnesium should be above 2. That is uh, a very important thing which can be taken care of by anybody. Uh, over to the other moderators. It's a very interesting case actually. The patient was saved by the timely ablation and it's very nice to... Uh, here from Hagri Rao. Uh, thank you very much for saving the patient. Thank Dr. you, sir. Dr. Tamil Selvan, you, you have a comment to make? Dr. Tamil Selvan, you will have to unmute, unmute yourself, please. Sir, so I would like to know the uh, difference, if at all, uh, by using, you would have, you would have used uh, propanolol in the place of metaprolol. Uh, what is our experience uh, of using uh, propanolol in uh, BT storm? No, in general, in all patients with ventricular tachycardia, uh, our experiences and our experience and data has always been used to use a selective beta blocker. In fact, metaprolol is uh, the most uh, well tested and the most efficacious uh, beta blocker that uh, we have used in this set of patients. In the sense, what I mean to say is in ischemic cardiomyopathy, the kind of patient that I'm presenting was ischemic cardiomyopathy. VT storms can occur due to different substrates. It can occur.
Kar, long QE can occur in uh, Brugada and so on and so on. But in ischemic cardiopathy and dilated cardiopathy, which uh, we see most often, I think the best drugs, beta blockers, would be uh, metoprolol. But the patient had ejection fraction around 35, isn't it, sir? In, in that case, uh, the, it, it will be useful if you uh, target the beta 2 receptors also, because the beta 1 receptor, receptors will be down regulated. See, the issue here is uh, see, the, the uh, issue of heart failure is, I think, a little different from VT. When you have uh, a VT which is predominantly fueled uh, by beta 1 receptors, I think it's selective beta blockers are certainly uh, very useful and they cause so much of bradycardia. Uh, which is also very useful in the management of BT storm. So I agree. This was a great case, and congratulations on a really nice outcome for such a challenging scenario. That's all credit to your skill set. Uh, just a couple of points, Mick, since you asked the question about ice for my talk. So if you, you were using ice uh, in this case, the benefit would have been you could have very quickly created the LV shell while also monitoring your cat so because you can see live how close you're getting to the thrombus. Uh, we typically don't hesitate to go into the LV if it's a laminate thrombus. I don't know if you could tell that or not, but that is something that is to be expected in a person with a healed myocardial infarct and a dyskinetic segment. And then the last point, more of a question, do you really think intraiotic balloon pump helps because Usually for these scenarios, uh, you, we generally use either an impeller or put them on an ECMO during the procedure. But I'm not sure if intraoric balloon pump necessarily <coughs> gives you much. So another uh, question I would like to ask is the uh, recent attempt of using transcutaneous magnetic stimulation to control these kind of uh, scenarios. Uh, what is your uh, take on that? I have no experience. I think Dr. Sanjay would uh, add to that. I have no experience with the magnetic uh, thing in VD storm. Uh, I, we have never used it. Okay. What about this uh, transjugular uh, uh, sympathetic ganglionectomy? Is it uh, is the procedure to be adapted before going for a surgical one? Uh, yeah. have, we, have we got any experience, sir? Uh, do you mean to say a trans, trans uh, jugular uh, cervical thrombectomy? Yeah, see, I, I think uh, in the last few years uh, in patients with PT storms, what you learned is uh, that uh, even if you do a sympathetic, the efficacy is not 100% as you have seen in this case. So, we personally, uh, uh, when we want to do it, we go in for a, a bilateral complete surgical excision from distal to T2, T4, a complete, a perfect excision to get any kind of uh, benefit. Thank you. I think that's an important Thank question you. that he has, um, Dr. Amal Salvan has raised, that is it useful to do a uh, percutaneous one. Uh, I, it is a very simple procedure. We do it as the first part of it, especially if you do not have a surgical. Yes, you said in your last talk, I heard that in the IHRS meeting, uh, yeah. when you said that, yes, please yes. Uh, enumerate yeah. it. Especially when, if you do not have the surgeon at hand, it's very useful to do a, uh, uh, left skeletal ganglion block using, but you should have an uh, echo and ensure that you are actually doing a perfect uh, injection. Uh, even if it goes haywire, still it doesn't really matter because there's not much of complications to do it, but it will just control. So everything added together, it is an incremental controlling factor. So I, I think it will be useful if you uh, do that. So thank you, Haigri. Uh, wonderful talk. You know, it's inspiring. You know, you took us such a great challenge in presence of LV thrombus is what you said. You know, sometimes we'll have to be really uh, pulling up our sleeves. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you know, I have this privilege of introducing and welcoming one of the, uh, the sharpest minds and the young star of electrophysiology in the country, Dr. Daljit Kaur Sagu, who has been the disciple of Dr. Nasiman, and she's going to be speaking on sarcoid myocarditis and the moderation would be by her own colleagues, Sharda and Devabrata. Sharda, well, she came to Chennai, Devabrata is in Kolkata and uh, ably accompanied by Dr. G. Selvarani, who I always admire, you know, with her work in interventional cardiology and her interaction with ECG. Uh, she had been uh, one of our 
so called well wishers of the program so selvarani welcoming you daljit welcoming you and all the moderators and over to the moderators sharada yeah thanks dr ullas um, uh, really pleasure to welcome uh, daljit the uh, bright youngster as already described by dr ullas um what to describe about her but uh, right now she is working uh, being trained uh, as a fellow with dr narsimhan in uh, care hospital she is continuing to work with the team uh, now moved to aig hospital in hyderabad um also co supervising the ep fellowship program there um very bright youngster and uh, authored many papers very research oriented and academic uh, so let's uh, take on the case so um, daljit over to you yeah um, can you hear me my screen is seen thank you for the kind introduction ma'am and ulla sir and thank you for having me here uh can you see my uh, screen not yet am i your people will help you alji hang on so somebody to coordinate with daljit to get the screen on good evening daljit ma'am yeah ma'am can you please share your screen with the audio on there's a green button down uh, which says Correct. share yeah. screen yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. ma'am. Please share your screen with the computer audio on. Perfect. It's on. Perfect. Now see. Yeah, yes, we're ready to see. We're able to see that. Can you please uh, go to the full screen? And Dalji, you are yeah, the full screen. You are the brightest today. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much, sir, uh, and thank you, High Grade, sir, because you have covered a lot of terminologies I will be using during my presentation. So I will be presenting in another case of right ventricular outflow tra uh, tachycardia. This case present is a young patient with a normal echo in 2016 presented with the VT, which is looking like a right ventricular outflow tra tachycardia. This LBBB with the two, three AVF. Uh, positive and one AVLQS suggestive of right ventricular outflow tract tachycardia, which was reverted with IV beta log, and then someone attempted took him for EP uh, study, and because a lot of PT morphologies were induced, no ablation was performed, and good thing was. Uh, MRI was done in this patient. So before going to that, I would like to highlight one thing. This is the sinus rhythm ECG of this patient, and I'd like to highlight. This sinus rhythm ECG is not a normal ECG. You can see there is a right bundle branch block. There is a little low amplitude QRS in the limb leads lead three lead AVF. So we have already published from a center one case series mentioning that if you have outflow tract tachycardia and the baseline ECG, if you have some kind of bundle branch block, some kind of fractionation of the QRS, low amplitude QRS, you should think of some another thing going on in this patient. So MRI was done in this patient, and you can see that in the MRI, this patient had a scar, which was a basal septal scar, which was more towards the right ventricular outflow tract plus intramural, extending towards the basal septum into the epicardium with the deep intramural scar in the epicardium. So I don't know why the diagnosis of viral myocarditis was was made in this patient. Anyways, because of the viral myocarditis made. No further investigation was done in this case, and the angiogram was done, which showed normal coronaries and single chamber ICD implanted. He was put on some drugs. He he was doing well for next two and a half years, but after two and a half years, he went into VT strong, and which was not responsive to multiple antiarrhythmic drugs because it was not responding to antiarrhythmic drugs. In April 2019, surgical videoscopy guided bilateral sympathetic tummy was done. I think all these terminologies has already been explained and spoken by Dr. Hygrid sir. So this is a nice ECG I wanted to put. So after an year, that is in May 2019, you can see the disease has progressed in this case, and you can see the QRS has become more fractionated in this in lead V1, lead V3. So there is something going on. So there is a progressive disease in this patient, and I don't know. This was not followed up. So anyways, in Jan 2020, again patient went into VT strong. Initially attempt to manage with the multiple antiarrhythmic drugs. 
March 2020, it was not manageable with anti-arrhythmic drug. When he came, he had more than 200 episodes of shock when he reached to us. And LRL was kept at 90 per minute to suppress the BT. It's a single chamber ICD. And once he reached, we tried because he was in strong. In the emergency, we gave him general anesthesia. We started lignoc and amiodarone infusion so that we thought that we can get rid of the strong. We can cool him off and stabilize the patient. And by this time, the EF had dropped to 40%. So with this under general anesthesia, Caesar with these drugs, we did the PET CT scan for this patient, which showed that a segmental uptake in the LV along with the baseline uptake, but the segmental uptake was around 7.2 SUV max. He had definite uptake. He was lucky. Which showed a non catheter granuloma. So, because he had MON2 and quantiferin positive, we didn't want to give only steroids. Other parameters for TB were negative. We didn't want to give only steroids. So, anti tubercular therapy along with steroid was started and along with the anti arrhythmic drugs. Luckily, he improved with this. We could extubate, shift him to the room, and after a few days, we discharged the patient on these drugs. He was doing well for a few days, but after two months, he again came with the increased episodes of the VT in next two months and you can see he had more than 200 episodes of the VT with lot of shocks. So now we thought again pet city was done and we showed uh, saw that the inflammation has come down. We thought that inflammation has been settled so we took the patient in the lab for the ablation. But when we took him for the ablation, you can see he was just going into the multiple morphology of the VTs, which were hemodynamically unstable and all were different morphologies. You can see it's an RS. This is right bundle, right axis, but RS and V1. It was hemodynamically stable. It didn't allow us to do any activation mapping. This is another morphology with the QR in lead V1. This is another morphology with V1 having a monophysic R. So we, we, we had to give multiple shocks to him because we were not able to, and it was patient was not staying in sinus for long. So I have just highlighted this 10 morphologies of the VT, which were all with the different morphology and different cycle length. Although he had almost kind of 15 morphologies, we, but these were the 10 morphologies which were requiring, which was sustained and which were required, which was requiring termination. And to highlight that this second morphology, which is right bundle with the QS in one AVL was much more predominant. And one of the right bun left bundle outflow track ventricular, right ventricular outflow track ventricular VT was also predominant. So we could not do any activation mapping because of this hemodynamic instability. We mapped epicardium, RV, LV, and the cusp. There were no low voltage signals except for except in epicardium, LV, basal anterior, and the anterolateral wall. But there were no abnormal signals. We mapped even RV and the LV. Both unipolar, bipolar voltages were normal except for. In the RV septum, we had some low voltage signal, but there were no abnormal kind of signals which we should do substrate ablation like Dr. Hygrip showed us. So thus we thought that the previous two morphology of the VT, we will pace map because we had taken the patient for ablation. I'm just showing only the epicardial map here. There's a anterior basal scar and you can see I've just highlighted one of the reason, although it's a low voltage, but there is no abnormal signal here. So we could not do any substrate modification in this patient. So only thing because we had taken an epicardial axis, the area we could write that right bundle, right axis kind of VT, we, could, we got a good pace map. That area was a phrenic capture. That's why you can see it's a long coop balloon we have placed. And just to get rid of the phrenic because that area had a phrenic capture. So to get rid of the phrenic, we have and just to make it sure that it's away from the blood vessels. We had placed the balloon and we have lifted the phrenic nerve so that we can perform ablation without any injury to the phrenic. So anyways, this ablation was performed for some seven, eight hours. And after that, we shifted him out. He thought We thought that at least some episodes will come down. And because we realized, although PET did, did not show much inflammation next time, but because of the so many morphologies of the VT induced in the lab, we tapered off the steroid and we changed from steroid along with the ATT to mycophenolate. And we continued multiple antirhythmic, including beta blocker, sotlol, mycelitin. I just want to highlight in the beta blocker, we tried in this patient, bisoprolol, we tried enteral ATTID also. So multiple B, uh, uh, different beta blockers were tried in this patient. He was stable for two months. 
in between he had lot of episodes maximum reverting with the atp but again after two months he came with a two to three shocks every another day another day so we thought let's again because we have given some drugs to the patient we took him in july again for the ablation so this time we had clinical vt1 you can see it's a v1 qr morphology that is looks like some septal vt next this is which we thought we have ablated successfully this is right bundle with qs in one avl at a slower cycle length it's a slower vt this time it was hemodynamically stable was still coming so this were the two clinical vt ecgs we had so when we took the same two morphology pvcs are there another day so because of sympathetic ablation sympathetic tummy was done what for this patient his sinus rate was very slow usually supposed to be in junctional with the vt or pvcs that's why initially we started a pacing so that we can suppress the vts and we should we can map the vts so these were the two predominant morphology seen and because we had this basal vt like with one avl negative with rbvb we had placed the uh, deca in the Anterior interventricular vein, but you can see it's not early, not a very convincing signal there. So within the R, the LV near the septum endocardial, we got a very good early signal. You can see it's an early signal, nice 40 millisecond early for that QRB BVT with the PVC2, and it's a nice site. We started ablation. So as soon as we started ablation, you can see in the halter also nicely it suppressed the PVCs. So, but we were when we were doing the ablation and trying to consolidate the lesion, you can see it's gone into junctional, junctional, and we had stopped pacing for some time. It gone into junctional. So, while we were doing this ablation, he he changed that this VT one is induced that right bundle and the QS and one AVL VT is again induced, which was hemodynamically stable this time. So, we thought we are lucky; it's an hemodynamically stable VT. We consolidated the lesion, consolidated the lesion for VT two, and then we started mapping for the VT one. But while doing that, you can see this has changed from VT1 to VT3. So VT3 is also right bundle. It's a di different cycle length, but it's a pattern break. V1 positive, V2 negative, again V3 positive. So because these both both these VTs are looking like epicardial VT. Before going to epicardial, last time we had done epicardial ablation, we thought we can attempt the wire wire mapping. So through the CS, what we had done, we have placed a wire in the one of the PLV, and we thought let's try pace mapping. So although we were not able to, you can see I am not able to see any signal. So no signals are seen seen at this site, but luckily we were able to capture at this site. But this it's not a good pace map. The pace map was not good. So at this side, PLV proximally, distally, and one more lateral branch we attempted pace map, but these signals were not good. We didn't get so ultimately we we took epicardial axis and started mapping. So while doing the viral mapping, you can see again VT3 is induced, which is sustained and hemodynamically stable, and we started mapping this VT3. And you can see we got a very good signal. This is one of the kind which Dr. Highgrave showed. This is a this is a low amplitude, high frequency signal, and this is another signal with the gap. And you can the signal to the onset of QR is the uh, the distance is 40 millisecond. We started pacing, and the distance from the stem to the onset of QR is. You can see the tiny signal has captured and not the main signal, and this was 50 millisecond. So this is a concealed entrainment, nice concealed entrainment, but PPI minus T cell is, is long and plus stim to QRS is longer than the EGM to QRS, which shows that uh, this is not a main isthmus where we should ablate. So we knew that we have to move nearby the area. We are somewhere nearby. So we got ultimately a better signal. You can see this is a higher frequency signal, which is 26 millisecond earlier. And we got a good PPI minus TCL. But you can see stim to EGM is almost zero. So it's an exit site. But this is the best we could get. And it's a concealed entrainment. So ablation was performed at this site. So you can see when we started ablation, at this site, the VT3 terminated and slowed down and terminated. And then during RFA, it changed to VT1 at a different cycle length. So we thought that that was a successful site of ablation. We, we consolidated the lesion at that site. And after consolidating the lesion at that site, we started mapping VT1 again. This is a site of ablation for VT3 with the pattern break. break. And now we have started mapping the VT1 again. Now you can see this is another site. This site, although it's an early signal, 30 millisecond early, but I would like to emphasize here, 
the initial part part of the signal is very low frequency so it's not i'm not sure whether it's very convincing but this is the earliest site we got we thought let's do entrainment we started entraining you can see that it's a good entrainment your post pacing uh, ppm minus t cell was less than 30 millisecond and it's a concealed entrainment the only thing is it's an exit site but this is the best we could get and we started ablation at this site and you can see when we started ablation the vt has slowed down even in the halter you can notice that the vt has slowed down but it took long time for termination so although it terminated we we consolidated the lesion it was coming again and again now it is again reinduced at a slower rate sometimes sustained sometimes non sustained we realized that this is we are near the exit site so even endocardial we didn't get a good signal so that's why we thought let's do endo ap mapping at this for this vt so your the upper two signals map distal and map proximal are the epicardial signal signal from the epicardial catheter and the third one is the signal from the endocardial catheter at the diagonally opposite side i'm sorry to side. interrupt you ma'am i'm extremely sorry yeah. to interrupt you ma'am two minutes of the screen time left yeah, yeah. i'll stop in two minutes it will be done in two minutes yeah so ablation was performed you can see this is a bipolar ablation was performed at this side this is an ra and the lo view bipolar ablation i know this is the measurement done it's a 14 mm i know it's a very yeah, it's not a very precise measurement but in different angle the measurement was from 14 to 23 mm we gave ablation at this side and i just have put one 3d map to show this is a superior view so that i can show the catheters this is the endocardial which was the active catheter from which ablation was performed and this is an epicardial catheter with wave like a patch and the bipolar ablation performed you can show that vt has been slowed down and after that terminated so after long time first time we we, we could see a sustained sinus rhythm of this patient so post ablation because the device was already era we again gave a donated dual chamber icd so that we can pace atria and he is doing well till now it's been two months so my only key message is all the right ventricular outflow tachycardias may not be idiopathic and we should look for markers of any underlying inflammation or scar during the sinus rhythm when it has been terminated cardiac mri especially if t2 mapping is not done if if edema is not seen it may not show the inflammation so you should not underrate the role of pet ct scan because the early treatment early diagnosis of inflammation we can halt the progress of the disease steroid resistance is not uncommon in sarcoid so always think if the patient is not responding you should consider steroid sparing regimen we have already published our data on that and ongoing inflammation is always under recognized so we have already published data saying that if you do ablation during an ongoing inflammation the outcome is not good so you should always treat the patient first once the inflammation is silent and still vts are there then you should take the patient for catheter ablation thank you uh yeah uh, great job and uh, bewildering uh, a number of vts uh, over there uh, it's an extremely challenging case and uh, i mean the time given also is uh, is not commensurate with the complexity of the case uh, while we understand just uh, wondering why there was so much of uh, uh, sustain like uh, arrhythmias of different kind going on you think uh, inflammation was not was there any inflammatory marker uh, which was uh, showing that it wasn't responding very well or anything but we have that already that done in our data we used to initially do all the inflammatory markers like hscrp or we used to do esr but we have realized that that doesn't correlate with the degree of inflammation so that we have already seen in the data so frankly speaking we didn't repeat the inflammatory markers but the fact that the pleomorphism we had around 15 morphologies when we took the patient on table the fact itself says that there is some underlying inflammation which which we should take care of But so that's why but you did the pet ct uh, you repeated a pet ct as i understand yes and inflammation had come down that's the reason we took him on the table rather that's the reason we thought inflammation has gone but we when we took the patient on table there were again a zoo of vt induced so i think that is another marker of when when you have so many vt morphologies coming from all different even from rv we had three different morphologies of vt from the lv multiple morphologies of vt that can be a marker of inflammation because two months of mycophenolet when we took him again the number of vts induced were five so from some 50 morphology it came down so i think there was some inflammation which has been treated over the two months 
somebody wanted you to uh, elaborate uh, what are the ecg markers of uh, cardiac sarcoid so sinus ecg markers you can get bundle branch blocks you can get fascicular blocks you can get vo low voltage complexes you can get fractionation of the qrs like i showed in this patient especially in the v1 and v3 seen nicely so i think these are the markers of the inflammation uh and uh, somebody also wanted to know why uh no dr yarve wanted to know why pr is short uh, and did you use infliximab we didn't use infliximab in this patient ultimately we use adalimumab in this patient ma'am and yes the pr is short but hv was normal because of the short time i have not put the his uh, so baseline hv was normal ah was very short in this patient right uh, any other comments from uh, the moderators the uh, vibrato uh, and more of a few places the pr looks very short i think it's a junctional rhythm also was coming because sinus was very slow so the few places it was the junctional acceleration and i think it was dissociation it was looking like pr conduction no the sinus conduction but because junction was faster than the sinus yes they hi hi uh, very elegant presentation so just uh, one or two uh, doubts uh, when did you do the pet repeat pet before the first ablation or the second ablation Second. Before the first ablation was done, first was baseline when he came to us, right, that and we sent him. I know. After, before the first ablation, repeat pet was done. There okay. was no update. Okay, if I have got your uh, case correctly, that in, then you said in the first ablation you took endoepicardial both approach, and you did not find much of substrate. No, there was except for there was a scar, but there were no abnormal signals to apply. There was no lava kind of signal. There were no late potentials. There were no fractionated low signal, okay. long I mean, fractionated. Yeah. We had scar in epicardium. We had scar on the RV side of the. Okay, okay. So means uh, from that one scar, how can we explain so many? Uh, morphology of vt at sarada madam that's why i was saying it's not scar related that's why i'm saying despite not having any abnormal signal it's inflammation related that's why i'm saying if it was scar related we could have right. substrate modification but, and number of morphologies of vt could have come down so but, there was no abnormal signals for us to do any modification i got your point but in the second ablation you did entrainment mapping that means you want to say so those are very very i think i think maybe it was they are you had given biological to the patient uh, when we took second time we were lucky because all vts we were able to do activation map yes so and entrainment we were able to do yes the entrainment uh, as you said means in the second uh, ablation most of your vts were reentrant as you, you want to say the one that would have come yes because i i have already showed we were able to we were able to entrain all the vts so i think all these were maybe scar related vts but some of the vts during uh, ablation you you tried to point out early signal in a reentrant vt there is is there any means signal because we didn't get that sort so yeah absolutely your point is well taken so both the sites especially the bipolar where we have ablated is that is the reason we have done bipolar because if it's an intramural vt you will not get mid diastolic signals right you will from endocardial or epicardial you will get only early so you are ablating only exit that's the reason there is a reason these are the intramural but at that site you had a concealed entrainment also yes so exit site Excuse me. You'll have to take one comment and a question from Dr. Salwarani, please. I think, uh, in the interest of the time. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you, Ulla, sir, and coaches, uh, Madam Sara, Madam, and it was a very lucid uh, presentation. And uh, uh, some of the patients can present with septal levities. We have to uh, make them undergo uh, cardiac MRI and uh, the inflammatory markers. and uh, we should not forget the other uh, uh, differential diagnosis uh, like uh, sle and uh, chronic uh, granular metastasis uh, hepatitis all those things and uh, it is said that uh, if you evaluate uh, rvot um, the arthmogenic uh, uh, rv uh, um, some of the patients 15 uh, to the tune of 15% they tend out to be uh, granular metastasis yeah, uh, sarcoid uh, myocarditis yes yes 
and uh, uh, how many people they present with a heart failure following sarcoid according to your experience in our in our data i think dr narasimhan will be able to answer that better how percentage i really don't remember but we we do have some 10 15% of the patient who come with the heart failure they may not come with the vt few come with the heart blocks also few comes with the vt and then later on they come with the heart failure if dr narasimhan is there the uh, actually a particular percentage i don't remember but we do get patient with the yeah sorry dr gajit while well, dr narsman takes that uh, question um, uh, somebody had asked uh, verbally i think at that time ki how do you define a pleomorphic vt what are the characters so, so in in the single strip if you see more than one morphology of monomorphic vt at least more than one two or three morphology of monomorphic vt the ecg i have put in my quiz is called pleomorphic vt whereas in polymorphic vt your axis is consistently changing it's b to b it's changing there is in pleomorphic vt you have more than one morphology of monomorphic vt so you'll have three four beats of one morphology then change to three four beats of another morphology at least uh, six consecutive beats uh, was what originally it was defined um anything have, else so you know what sharda you know what we will we will wait for dr nasiman can he quickly come on to that because it was an important question raised by salwaran uh, heart failure and sarcoidosis if you can quickly okay. come Oh, we can adopt selvarani i think uh, there's a very pertinent question uh, if you take uh, patients where we do an ablation without realizing it's sarcoid a percentage of them the ablation will address the vt cosmetically the vt will go away but the underlying inflammation progresses to the extent they go on to a transplant list sooner or later but the problem is uh, in some people it's a self limited disease and in some people it progresses so that is the reason why it is extremely important to make the underlying disease uh, diagnosis before pro uh, progressing our uh, thing is we are just publishing next uh, jack issue that is about if you have patients who have residual inflammation intense inflammation but severe heart failure even ph severe mr requiring almost like a transplant but their basal uptake is very good they do very well without a transplant you intensively treat them we have had patients referred for transplant evaluation who have improved very well on the other hand the uptake is poor pet uptake is poor mri shows a lot of scar they don't do well. there's no scope for immunosuppression they need to go for transplant So, Dr. Narsimhan, thank you very, very much. You know what? You are the, you are the experts. You know the 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 program was uh, you know designed in such a way that the the, the best of the minds in sarcoidosis, this you and your team member Sharda, Devaprita, and Daljit, were the best minds to speak about uh, this sarcoid issue. And Selvaran, you also contributed so much in in making us to understand from the best of the minds. And let me tell you here that Dr. Yash Nokanwal's comments, I think, it is the best. Uh, you know the compliments to your team dr yash says to go behind such kind of a survive i can read up uh, the 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 message from him that it requires a team which has experience the expertise and the perseverance and all of you all of you the speaker the moderators and the guide dr narsimhan actually this is the this is a compliment from my guru yash and from the entire csi family thank you very very much it was a great uh, session indeed thank you very very much and now we proceed to one of my closest dear friend ashish nabar who is actually going to be organizing the same platform but in a very very big way uh, the ihrs conference and he is going to be talking on maxillary and related issues and i have this privilege of uh, handing over uh, this session uh, to Uh, three uh, important members of the CSI, and those are uh, the electrophysiologist Dr. T. R. Murugudaran, and aspiring electrophysiologist and may, almost made name in Chennai city at least as an electrophysiologist Dr. Ilai Raja, and one of the senior members of the CSI who has a great interest in interventional cardiology, in pacemakers and devices, including. uh the therapies for the hocm etc dr satyamurthy dr satyamurthy to take over the session and introduce dr ashish nabar and you will be 
you will be ably assisted by murli and ilaya raja over to you dr satyamurthy uh, thank you dr ullas i invite dr murli dharan professor and head of the department of cardiology at srmc chennai and dr ilaya raja who is consult senior consultant cardiologist at uh, bilrath hospital chennai and i take this opportunity to invite our speaker dr ashish nahar uh, who is organizing secretary of annual conference of ihr society <clears throat> and he is consultant cardiologist at jupiter hospital thani and also visiting electrophysiologist at km hospital without losing much time i invite him to talk on the uh, when do when does he use mexilitin and sotalol in which situations he use may I, it is uh, may i request dr ashish nahar please yeah thank you dr uh, ilai raja for a very kind introduction and uh, we could possibly make this question little more democratic and say when should we use uh, mexilitin or sotalol for pt so this talk is divided into kind of three parts where in the first uh, part i made first sec- set of slides make a case for anti arrhythmic drugs still having a role in treating vt in structural heart disease possibly even after an icd implant in the next few slides i'll probably point out to the vt syndromes that we deal with in the clinical situation which is uh, then easy to understand for the non ep cardiologists and then come down to where is the niche to use mexilitin and sotalol in vt in structural heart disease so it is beyond doubt that icd is required in vt with structural heart disease whether you are dealing with an hemodynamically stable vt or an unstable vt presently there is no debate that you should give icds but it is not an open and shut case because these people tend to get at least 5% appropriate shocks per year when they are symptomatic for heart failure so one has to deal with this recurrent vt and even a single appropriate shock effectively increases the mortality risk whether it's related to the vt or whether it's related to the worsening structural heart disease the mortality risk goes up and if he gets more than one icd shocks then it goes up further plus the shocks affect the mental well being of a person his ability to tolerate the shock and lead a normal life comes in question and we do have questions how to in how and when to initiate anti arrhythmic drug therapy if one gets one shock do you start or when you wait for some more shock so all that is clinical experience and individual judgment if you look at the use of anti arrhythmic drugs from this medicare data from 2012 one can see that we are significantly under using the beta blockers in these patients so two thirds of them probably more should receive but we are required to use class 1 and class 3 drugs in almost one fourth of the patients and obviously our first choice is amiodron but some patients are on sotalol and mexilitin so there is definitely a need to use anti arrhythmic drugs in these patients even after they receive an icd and there is a difficulty with these anti arrhythmic drugs because only half of the patients can be on the same anti arrhythmic drug in the same dose over a long term in fact almost one third of the times you may have to withdraw the drug or have to reduce the doses of the drug or may have to add some other drug so anti arrhythmic drug use is still very much alive in this group of patients and why do we say amiodron is our first choice is because it is better than sotalol so beta blockers are definitely more useful but when you have to make the next choice it is amiodron because it reduces the recurrent vts in these patients however you should not use icd uh, however you should not use amiodron in patients for primary prevention even if they have a structural heart disease and heart failure but using amiodron is not so simple it has its own problems which means that first of all you should use beta blocker pre amiodron and even when you use amiodron the difficulty is that even with higher doses of amiodron you could have recurring vt amiodron has a great discontinuation rate over long term and very isolated situations you may have that amiodron use is related directly to uh, toxicity which results in death so 
Once again, MUR, you must look beyond MUR drawn when you're treating VT in structural heart disease. So probably what is more uh, prevalent in the current literature is to try and ablate. And that's where Dr. Highgreave and Dr. Daljit brought that aspect out. Now, all the randomized controlled trials that you have in terms of ablating a VT in structural heart disease post-infarct VTs, we probably have less studies in patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. And these ablations have been done before the ICD is implanted to reduce the ICD shocks. They have been done when the recurring shock after an ICD is hemodynamically stable, so they prolong the time to the recurrent VT. And they have been done even when the VT is unstable and some benefit has been obtained. But presently, we are probably more concerned with this vanish trial where Patients had a VT storm despite one anti-arrhythmic drug, and there they compared the benefit of up titrating amiodron or adding mexylatin to doing an ablation. We do need to look beyond catheter ablation in these patients with recurrent VT after an ICD because many patients are able to be brought to the cath lab because they are high risk for the procedure or they have severe heart failure. The ablation procedure itself has a limited success and depends on how you define the success. These processes are very complicated and they can result in complications. And there are a lot of recurrences more in patients with DCM probably than in patients with skin cardiomyopathy. So ablation is definitely an option, but it is once again not everything in these patients with recurring VT after an ICD. And therefore, actually, although the vanish study said that you can ablate better than escalating the antiarrhythmic drug therapy, I think if you read through the fine print, there is still very much a role for escalating the antiarrhythmic therapy. And that's because some of these points, every time the VT burden is not so much that you want to bring the patient to the cath lab, they could be successfully terminated with ATP, but they're recurring. So you don't want to have them you may have a possibility to up titrate the present dose of amiodron or add amexylatine and up titrate it. It may take time for you to organize the ablation procedure, so you will require antiarrhythmic drugs to come in. And then once again, your ablation procedure may not be entirely successful to take away all the VTs and you may need antiarrhythmic drugs. So even in the VANISH trial, I think there is a room for antiarrhythmic drugs. What the VANISH trial really tom toms about is that the primary outcome was better and that primary outcome is a composite of death and appropriate therapies after 30 days. And I think there is something that one must understand that you have a significant period after the ablation in the first 30 days where they still keep on having the VT recurrences and it is only after 30 days that you are able to quiesce these VTs. So you need antiarrhythmic drugs even after ablation in the initial period. Of course, the difficulty when you use antiarrhythmic drugs in this situation is you can make the VT slow and then it can tend to be incessant. So once again, managed trial does advocate ablation to escalating the antiarrhythmic drug therapy. But if you read through the fine print, the benefit comes a little late and therefore there is room for getting an antiarrhythmic drug therapy. I switch gears here and just outline the VT syndromes which are recognized by the electrophysiologist and which could be of some help as a non-EP cardiologist tries to understand this. Now, we have a habit of trying to stop or taper away the antiarrhythmic drugs after implanting an ICD. You want to hold back cordron because of its toxicity and probably there is a role for sotalol here. You can probably use sotalol as a first-line therapy if the ejection fraction permits. If the ejection fraction is good, you may hold back cordron till there are recurrences and therefore sotalol can have some role in suppression of the VT. The second kind of a syndrome that you may deal with is there are VT recurrences, but they are quite well treated with the device therapies and they are not in clusters, but they happen with the gaps of few days, but they are recurrent and you would ideally, as we said initially, not like to have too many appropriate therapies because they do affect the cardiac function and the mortality. But for example, if you have frequent ATPs or you have very fast VTs, you may use antiarrhythmic drug therapy to reduce the VT recurrences or to make a fast VT slower so that it is more amenable to the ATP. So once again, there is a room for antiarrhythmic drug therapy. The only thing you must remember is probably not combine same class of drugs, but combine probably a class three and a class one drug. And there is 
there comes the example of one of the drug that I need to speak about, amiodron plus mexilatine. Mexilatine is not av now available to us, and therefore it, one should remember that one can combine amiodron and mexilatine. And there has been similar experience with combining some other class one and class three drugs to bring about the same benefit. The third VT syndrome that you might uh, kind of experience is the situation that probably Daljit said, the VT storm. So once again, storm has been defined previously as more than three episodes in a day. So it's clustering of those VT episodes and there could be a need to have antiarrhythmic drugs here also. Ablation is useful only when it is successful. A partially successful ablation may be still a difficulty and these patients are usually sick. Most of the studies are from very capable centers and for a routine practice, one still needs to use antiarrhythmic drugs because there is a room to escalate the same amiodron if it is in a lower dose. There is a possibility to add amiodron if some another drug is being used in a VT storm patient and there is a room to add mexilatine and uptitrate it. So, mexilatine does have a role in the situation when amiodron is already on to be added as an one more therapy to get control of the VT storm. This is a little difficult subset, the fourth subset of VT syndrome, where the VT is too slow and as a result of it, it is incessant and can lead to heart failure if untreated. So here, you can program the ICD lower down the detection and try to terminate the uh, VT, but, but escalating antiarrhythmic drugs sometimes may not be useful because here you, you may just slow it further and make it more incessant and ablation probably would be a better strategy in this case. So I think these are the different uh, scenarios in which the VT, recurring VT presents after an ICD and you must identify them and try to see where your niche for pushing in anti drugs. Mexilatine I think is a good drug because every antiarrhythmic drug has a great negative chronotrop negative inotropic effect and a dorsard potential and therefore mexilatine is one drug one class one drug, which is the least torsadogenic. And there is definitely, there has been old evidence which suggests that amidron plus mexilatine does give a short term arrhythmia control better. It can be updated to a dose of almost 600 milligram per day, but the average dose usually used is about 400 milligram. It is probably preferred in patients who are older in age and have more CKD. These are probably the patients you don't want to bring to the cath lab easily. But the long-term efficacy of using mexilatine continuously is still not very clear. But in short term, adding to amiodron would make sense. Where specifically, if I were to point out, it could be that you have ablated these patients and are unsuccessful with the optimal medical therapy where you may add amiodron, mexilatine to amiodron. It could be a situation where you use lignocaine in addition to IV amiodron and found some benefit and then now you want to switch to a oral class 1 drug where mexilatine can be added after switching on lignocaine. And in unsuccessfully treated patients with optimal medical therapy, once again, where who do not qualify for RAF ablation, whom you don't want to bring to the lab because of the feared complications. In such patients, you may add mexilatine to amiodron. So there are these are specific clinical situations where you should consider adding mexilatine to amiodron. The good thing about mexilatine is that it is reasonably well tolerated, and unlike some other anti drugs, you don't have a great need to discontinue the the uh, The tolerability is very good, and I can recent publications which have used mexilatine for as long as eight months after that VT storm or uh, events were added to amiodron, it could be continued for that longer period with a significant reduction in the different VT events. So amiodron plus mexilatine does seem a good combination and it seems opportune currently to discuss with the availability of mexilatine in our situations. There is one another use of mexilatine in a VT situation. All of us are very well in news that mexilatine is useful to treat patients who have long QT3 syndrome, but there are other long QT patients where bradycardia does turn to be a problem. So even if they are LQT1 or LQT2, if they get in then they have more bradycardia induced QT prolongation and therefore a risk of VT. So in these patients, it can be combined with lignocaine, mexilatine can be added or mexilatine can be used 
even in other sorry to interrupt sir i'm yeah, extremely sorry take to interrupt two, few minutes thank you so much yeah. thank you thank you sotalol is again more useful in patients who have ischemic cardiomyopathy than in patients who have non ischemic cardiomyopathy one has to be careful to use it in patients who have not more than a moderate lv systolic dysfunction when you deal with cardiomyopathy is dilated cardiomyopathy and arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy is are the one where you use sotalol you do not use it in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because of a possibility of torsadogenic effect you require higher doses of sotalol almost 320 mg per day and like as in atrial fibrillation and therefore it is recommended that you should start this preferably in hospital low doses can possibly be started in out patient but high doses need to be started and updated it in the hospital and it should be avoided in patients who have decompensated heart failure and have severe lv systolic dysfunction because of its negative inotropy sotalol can be used in patients of frequent pvcs and known structural heart disease but its role in patients who have structural heart disease and recurrent vt is a little doubtful and the reason that has come into doubt is i'll conclude with this slide is where apparently amiodron plus mexlatin was better but using sotalol led to increase in vt recurrence and icd shocks as compared to amiodron so this recent uh, meta analysis and systemic review seems to put sotalol in a bad light so i would say that where you have you have uh, no structural heart disease and pvcs or you have vt in structural heart disease and you have an icd and he has infrequent shocks i think sotalol is useful so this is my concluding slide which where i would like to say that escalating antiarrhythmic drug therapies plus catheter ablation is the first thought that we should come in mind uh, Uh, escalating amiodron is limited by its side effects ablation use is limited by its high recurrence rate so mexlatin combining with amiodron is good in short term the long term aspect of it might still need to be clear but the good thing is it has a good safety profile and sotalol is good for pvcs with no structural heart disease or post aicd when the shocks are uh, infrequent and you want to hold back cordron i think there sotalol has a role you got to be careful that these are not the patients who have a heart failure or a very severe lv systolic dysfunction i think i'll hand here and i thank you for your patient hearing thanks over to the moderators please <clears throat> hi dr murali you would like to yes, make sir. any comments hi nabar it's a hi. a very clear lucid presentation of use of this drug particularly it's very useful for uh, many of our viewers wherein uh, it looks it's slowly becoming amio is the only antiarrhythmic for uh, most of the vts in our day to day practice like uh, things like we are using pencil in peridure for every std we are using amio on left and right time to think of all these drugs you uh, present very nicely um Uh, one thing is like uh, uh, in in amio induced qt prolongation do you think uh, uh, particularly mexlatin combination will be of a uh, of uh, an effective therapy or any ot mexlatin uh in case of qt prolongation which is uh, drug induced there is not much evidence that with amio no in rt uh, reduction post icd when the qt is prolonged on amio around would you like yeah. to change over to mexlatin on such situation or stop amio on change over or combine mexlatin along with amio so if amiodron is responsible for qt prolongation and it is in the torsadogenic range if the qt is more than 540 560 then obviously you have to cut back the dose of amiodron and if, see if that helps because amiodron still remains your first choice unless you absolutely have a non consistent vt runs then you take it away completely but if it is only a qt prolongation you might want to uh, cut back on the cord amiodron and see if that is good enough but if you have non consistent vt runs then probably you would obviously get out of uh, amiodron and uh, then you need to use something else so if it is a singular drug that you want to use uh, probably you can use mexlatin and beta blockers or you can if somebody has a icd only then you can leave on beta blockers and use mexlatin only if there are uh, icd therapies that are coming so you would scale it according to 
whether uh, uh, the icd uh, is fired or uh, firing or whether the icd is uh, silent you always have the backup of the icd if there are therapies happening repeatedly then you would add uh, a maxillary into beta blocker but otherwise you might just cut back the cord on and leave on beta blocker till the qt uh, comes back to you now in which in which situations you use intravenous uh, maxillary so intravenous maxillatin we don't have we have only the oral form of maxillatin and uh, some thinking that if your uh, lignocaine wo is working uh, lignocaine is obviously used when you think that uh, ischemia has a role in uh, the recurrence of the vt uh, and you use lignocaine and you find that the lignocaine helped you to control the vt in addition to amiodron or as a only drug Uh, then it seems sensible to think that if you uh, have to switch to the oral form after stopping lignocaine then uh, maxillatin being from the same class uh, seems to be the right thing to do because now uh, companies planning to bring intravenous uh, maxillatin initially if you remember in early 80s they introduced intravenous maxillatin we used to use in acute myocardial infarction when there is a, a lignocaine sensitive to tachycardias mm-hmm. Rather, we can call uh, maxillary as a oral lignocaine. Is that not so? Yes, yes, I think so. Can I, can I, can I have sir? Not me. Yeah, yeah. Please, please. Why not? <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so, good evening, all, and uh, it's a great work by uh, CSI Chennai chapter and uh, Dr. Ullas uh, for having this uh, uh, cardiac rhythm uh, digital meet India, and I wish him, you know. congratulations for the next consecutive days and it's a great presentation by ashish nabha he covered everything but uh, this is a covid era and we had a lot of issues uh, regarding this acquired long qt interval syndrome uh, so if already a cardiac patient on certain drugs and then if they have uh, if they develop a covid uh, a disease then how to treat them especially uh, in this uh, uh, kind of acquired long qt interval uh, syndrome disorder in the covid pandemic uh, background the mexidin really plays a, a major role and um, another thing uh, uh, though the frequency of uh, long qt interval monitoring there are certain protocols laid by indian uh, ihrs uh, uh, protocols but when honestly we follow that is not really helpful actually i i need a input from others because uh, the basal uh, qtc versus uh, the linear relation with the possibility of developing a uh, uh, tarsoids or you know the baseline showing some prolonged qt but when they are go on drugs but they are not uh, developing the clinical uh, disease as such so all those things i am leaving it to for the you know senior consultant to have uh, their views and then regarding a uh, uh, one comment regarding dr moridharan sir said Uh, so when you want to add uh, you know a uh, kind of amiodarone showing a prolonged uh, qt interval syndrome kind of picture and what is the role of mexidine something like that but uh, references say clearly that among the class 3 drugs amiodarone is the one drug that can uh, despite showing in the surface ecg prolonged qt interval that can reduce a qt dispersion and there is a good study uh, I find that I could not remember the other quinidin versus uh, amiodarone, and that's why among the class three drugs, despite upper limit of uh, QT interval, amiodarone can be safely con- uh, continued because that reduces QT dispersion. But as uh, Dr. Ashish Nawar mentioned, that uh, the amiodarone uh, uh, can be safely combined with the mexidin, or since we are talking about mexidin, mexidin one drug that can be safely combined with the beta blocker, amiodarone, and other class of drugs. and finally regarding uh, the sotalol that's a good molecule but uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, one word about uh, chirally pure molecules the concept of uh, chirally pure molecules and then enhancing their effectiveness uh, you know in uh, uh, in promoting the pharmacokinetics positive way still a fascinating subject in any molecule they have not uh, tested success in swot trial they used uh, desotalol it's a negative study from that moment onwards still we are using d and l uh, steroids containing stotalol only 
and uh, now that has its own uh, limitation. But uh, adding the drugs, escalation drugs, combination, all those things, beautifully explained by Dr. Ashish Samar. One second, uh, thanks for the opportunity, and uh, no, I, I I really congratulate uh, Dr. Ullas and the uh, CSH Chennai chapter for the subsequent or uh, consecutive days. Thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah, you are perfectly right. In fact, uh, Amiyo independently QT prolongation rarely associated with TARSARS because the QT dispersion is not significant. In fact, if you see, there are literature where they looked at not only QT interval, but T peak to end, T wave peak to end will will indirectly show the QT dispersion part. That is one thing. That's the uh, meaning because of the, the varying effect on the endo, AP, and the M cells, this effect. So, well, then. But the problem is, Amio causing QT prolongation it is not that dangerous. But Amio QT prolongation along with other factors coming in, metabolic abnormalities or any other thing, can still precipitate arrhythmia. That's a problem. So, in, in those situations, we are worried about the QT prolongation. But this is a wonderful point, and the T peak to end is often uh, not looked uh, seriously by many uh, physicians. But that's an interest, interesting measurement which will tell you exactly whether the QT dispersion is good or bad. Yes, sir. So, thank you, everybody. You know, actually, uh, there's so much of a discussion on QT interval, and Ilaraja raised this issue about in the COVID era, the medications one have been giving, you know, some QT prolongations. We have an exclusive day uh, for the QT prolongation and uh, QT interval related issue in the coming uh, days. Uh, Dr. Ashish, as usual, we learned a great deal from you, especially as our Murali was talking about we need to be looking at you know, specific indications apart from omedron, looking at sotelol and mexilitin to use uh, uh, use for the treatment of PT. So, ladies and gentlemen, you know, I would like to announce here that you know it was a huge success day one of this cardiac rhythm council. You know, I am looking at you know the numbers here, it is crossing 350. It's a huge success. Thank you, everybody who had tuned in. And you know, I, I I request everybody to be stay staying connected with us for the coming four more days, five more days rather. Every day starting from 6:30. And uh, thank you everybody. Uh, you know, especially the the last week on the list topic was so very useful. I believe looking at the 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 comments and the responses from the audience. So uh, we we take leave from today, but you know, we are joining tomorrow. Uh, thank you very very much and happy evening. And um, see you people uh, tomorrow. Thank you very, very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Loss. Thank you. Bye. Thank right. Thanks very much.